This morning as we pray, let's remember Brother Carl and Francis. Uh, he is back in the hospital, I understand. And I know he needs our prayers. And uh, I know that he would appreciate it very much. Uh, we, uh, he, he's got quite a long road to go to recover. Uh, we also want to remember Doyle and Amy in our prayers. Uh, I was uh, talked to Doyle yesterday. He is uh, doing better than Ann, I think. But they're both struggling with losing their son at, at such a young age, or at least it seems pretty young to me. And, uh, but he, uh, he told me yesterday he was very thankful for the church and for y'all's prayers. And uh, he just wanted to express appreciation and uh, just continue to pray for Ann. And I'm going to add Ann Dole, because they both need it. And then, you tell me, Glenn, you tell me about the lightning strike uh, with your family. That, niece and grandniece. Niece and grandniece. That had to be scary for them. It was scary. Yeah. Uh, the youngest one was hot early in the Yeah. I was on a golf course one time back in college. And it hit a tree, a pretty good piece from me, but I still think we felt it in the ground. It, it, it was, it was, it's a scary thing. It sure is. And uh, we, uh, as we pray for these needs and, and others that you know of in the church, we listed several Wednesday night and prayed for them. And as you know those, we want to continue to pray for them. But especially for these three, uh, we, we want to say a prayer for and a prayer for Thanksgiving for, for you being here today. I appreciate you inviting me back and uh, always enjoy coming. Uh, enjoy being here with this church family. And let's pray. Father, it's a great day today. We have people who are hurting and may not quite see it that way. But Lord, you do, and you change lives. And you can change the thoughts that we're struggling with. We pray for physical healing for Brother Carl. We pray for spiritual encouragement and strength for Doyle and Ann. We pray for the family that, that, that had the lightning strike, that they will recover and that they will not grow weary in trusting you and frightful of storms. Father, today in our message, we pray for your leadership in every life here. We pray that you'll use some part of the message to speak to all of us, beginning with me. And so may the message today bring honor and glory unto your name. We thank you for this church, for the blessings it brings to this community, and your guidance and leadership in all that happens. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. I just want you to know that sometimes I feel like physically I'm falling apart. Y'all ever get that feeling? Uh, how do I know whether I'm, I'm sick or better? Well, I have a diabetic doctor in Jackson, and when I go see her, the first thing she wants to look at is my blood work and my little notebook that I keep my blood sugar counts in regularly. I thought I was sloppy enough that she wouldn't notice it, but I took about six weeks off. Uh, she didn't like that very much. She said, and I'll quote, how are you going to know how you're doing if you don't check your blood sugar? I don't know. And uh, so I have been better this three months before I go back to, to have a record of it. Uh, how, how do you know when you're physically sick? Uh, you have symptoms. You feel bad. You, you have those kind of problems. There are a lot of different things that, that, that happens. Uh, the doctor tells you you can't fish for two or three weeks. That's not a good thing at all. Uh, I can assure you of that. But I have been very faithful to listen to him. I have learned in previous times that they really do know what they're talking about most of the time. And so I'm going to listen to what the doctor has to say uh, physically. What about spiritual health? How do you know if you're spiritually healthy or not? Have you ever thought about that question? How do you know if, if you're really spiritually healthy or 
spiritually unhealthy. Well, Paul, writing in Titus, wrote to Titus and, and gave us some super good advice on, on recognizing that. Uh, one author used a term called cer cer ceremonial purity. Not personal, but ones that's involved around a demonstration, uh, an, an act. Uh, I had a notebook to turn into my diabetic doctor. I gave it to her, and she was smart enough to see there was a section in there where there was no dates. Uh, I really didn't think she would notice it. I write pretty sloppy, I have to admit that. And it was in a notebook, it wasn't typed or anything like that, just in a little flip notebook that I had, and I would written it down in there. And I kind of blended it all together, and I thought, well, I'm off the hook. I think sometimes we try to do that with our Christianity, our purity. Uh, purity means without blemish, w without illness, w without being blameless or free from evil. If we're blameless, if we're free from evil, we cannot live like the world. It has to be a difference in how we live our lives. And Paul says the way you know how you're doing spiritually is some of the things that he says that we're to do to bring purity on. And, and it's very difficult to know without realizing what, what we've done. It, it means, it, Paul talks about us being defiled. Well, that just means that we are uh, polluted or stained. Uh, or, or something like like that. Unbelieving is without trust, and that's what he challenges us to do. Let me read chapter 1 of Titus, verses 15 and 16, and then chapter 2 of Titus, verse 1. Titus chapter 1, verse 15, he says, To the pure, all things are pure. But to those who are defiled and unbelieving, nothing is pure. But both their mind and their conscience are defiled. They profess to know God, but by their deeds they deny Him. Being detestable and disobedient and worthless for any good deed. Boy, that's, that's pretty strong language, isn't it? But, that, but Paul says to Titus, you have to recognize that. But he says to Titus this, and to us, But as for you... Speak the things which are fitting for sound doctrine. Do that kind of uh, a movement. The three comparisons I found in this particular chapter that I think are relevant for us today. And if we choose the right one of the two uh, the, in, in each comparison, then we will have spiritual health. But if we choose the other one, we'll be spiritually unhealthy. It's amazing what different ailments can cause problems. Uh, I uh, have discovered that there are times when I need to recognize different changes in my body. The doctor did tell me I could be occasionally out of balance, but only occasionally. I interpreted that at the beginning to be a couple of three times a week. That's not exactly the way they interpreted it. So sometimes we think we can be spiritually imbalanced six days a week and come on the seventh day to church and get balanced again. It just doesn't work that way. So three comparisons. First one is, is it ritual or relationship? Now, you know, that, that, that's a pretty important question. Do we do things ritually? The Hebrews were very bad about that. They had their altars. They had their, their worship. They went three times a year to Jerusalem for special ceremonies. And then when they discovered that they were not pleasing God, he said, I want your life, your heart, I want to have a relationship with you. I don't want your sacrifices until I have you, your heart, very distinctively. And, and when I think about that, do I have just my traditions or do I have an ongoing relationship with Christ? Am I depending on what my parents did 
or what my children are doing or do I depend upon my relationship with Christ? When I have spoken to Christ and invited him to my life, I have a relationship. Until then, it's a ritual. It's going through the motions. It is not being what we should be, not being the challenge that we should be. We need to be saved and living it. It's both avenues in there. When Jesus was speaking on the Sermon on the Mount, he says, there ought to be some things that you do first. Seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness is exactly the way Jesus spoke it to the disciples. And all these things will be added unto you. When I think of that, when I, I seek first the kingdom, that's God's rule in my life. That, that's God's taking over my life and controlling it because if I'm in his kingdom, he is king. And the king had authority over life and death. And so I, I think about that. But he also said in righteousness, not only do I have Christ as my savior, I am his servant to do the things that he would challenge me to do and the information that he would give to me. Do we look pious or are we being holy? There was a man praying in the temple one day, and this is how he prayed. Thank God I'm not like that person over there. He's a scoundrel. Thank God I'm better than he is. And the guy over there, head bowed, looking down, saying, God, have mercy on me. I'm a sinner, and I need your mercy, and I need your cleansing. So do we do ritual? looking pious or do we do righteousness relationships being controlled by God the second thing he says in these verses do we go by rules or by righteousness the Pharisees had something like 667 laws that they followed and they were all different kind of laws but the more than the Ten Commandments more than the book of covenants in Exodus. They had law after law after law after law. And Jesus didn't always obey the man-made laws. Always obeyed the laws of God. But not the ones the Pharisees had made up. Do you know as a Pharisee you could walk so many steps? And that was it. So if you walked too many steps going there, you couldn't go back home. Till the Sabbath day was over. I always thought that was ironic that you could count steps but not count the lives that it was affected by the people. So, so as I thought about this, I thought about us today. Do we want certain rules or do we want a righteousness that comes from God? Which is it? Which is it that we really want? And, and rules are easier than righteousness. Rules you can read and obey. I know that one day on North Hill Street, I'm going to see a blue light in my mirror because I disobey the law there. It says 35 miles per hour. That's difficult for me to do. Now, it's not impossible, and probably when I get my ticket there, I'm going to do a lot better about following that guideline, or not guideline, that rule that they have. Uh, but when I'm talking about Christianity and life, righteousness is living my life according to the way Christ would have me live. I think about, there's two things I think about. WWJD, what would Jesus do? And then there's a book that talks about in his steps. And it talks about a church, a town becoming more like Christ. What's priority for us? Is priority being like Christ? Or is it being something else? What's detestable? Something we dislike strongly. I will have to admit to you, one of those things that I dislike strongly is cooked cabbage. I just don't like it. I don't even try to like it. Don't even want it in the room. Don't even want to smell it cooking. Now somebody out here is saying, Boy, I love that. 
I just love it. I am not one of those. To me, it's detestable. But what about the spirit of the life that we live? Sometimes it's disobedience. We have had two, three, four grandkids this weekend, of which we carried them to the rodeo last night. It was a good time had by all, very late, and they woke up very grumpy this morning. Uh, but, but, but they're going to survive. I came here and left Patty with the grandkids. So I don't know how that is, but we'll meet for lunch and, and, and send them home. Uh, what, what is disobedience? What they were doing this morning. That's what it was when they were grumpy. What's worthless to be of no value? That's how we live our lives, worthless, if we don't live them for the cause of Christ. There is one way and one way only to righteousness, and that is through Jesus Christ. The last thing I want to call your attention to is religion or reality. Do we have just a spoken religion or do we have a reality of righteousness and relationship with Christ? The Puritans, which really surprised me. I was reading about them this, this week, and they had some terms that, that just really impressed me. One of those terms was heart religion. If you had just religion and not heart religion, they... they uh, meant that you did not have a faith. If you had heart religion, to them it was a faith that was not just obeying a set of rules, but having a heart that sought God and his ways, and the change of heart led to their change of mind. So they wanted a heart religion that made a difference in the reality. Listen to what he says. But as for you, in chapter 2, verse 1, we are different people because of what Christ did, is doing, and will do for us. But as for you, be different. Be changed. Speak the things which are fitting. Not a formal teaching situation, but just a conversation as we spend time with God. We're never off duty. We always are to speak the things which are appropriate, are fitting. We are responsible to teach the truth. And I like the way Deuteronomy says it. With your family, when you're walking, when you're talking, when you're sitting, when you're resting, speak what it needs to be said, consistently teaching the truth. Fitting is in accordance or appropriate. What are those things that are appropriate? I have discovered two things that I wish I did more often. One is when I get on an elevator, I've got a captive audience. I have been more and more asking the person how they're doing and what I can pray for them about. And we say a quick prayer while we're riding on the elevator. I also have discovered that waitresses and waiters, when they come to serve your table, every now and then, I will say to them, I always have a blessing on my meal. What can I pray for you during this blessing? And to me, that has been a way that I can communicate with people that Christians do care. One of the things I've discovered also, it is um, very common for us to be critical of other people. If we don't have the relationship that leads to righteousness, that is reality in our lives, we will have that tendency. We even tell jokes on churches uh, about how, and we're really being critical. One that I heard recently that I'm still thinking about, there was a church who had been praying that a tavern or a bar would, would be closed down. They had prayed for months because of the location, and you had to drive by to get into the church. And so they began to pray and pray and pray, and lightning struck the, the tavern and burned it down. They, the tavern owners took it to court. They sued the church. The church tried to defend it was an act of nature. The disciple, the tavern owner, said it was their fault. The judge ruled in front of the tavern owner because he said apparently he believes more in your God than you do. 
I thought about that. You know, that's, that's, that's critical of what the church has to say. But also we need to realize that we need to set positive examples for our community. Let me tell you about two or three. One positive example, the first funeral I preached ever, I was in Atala County and a deputy sheriff walked up on the porch and was shot by the person he was coming to serve a warrant to. I was 19 years old. I had never experienced anything like that. But you know, that church in Atala County took me in and ministered to me and took that family of four little boys and a mother and ministered to them. At Christmas, they didn't have any wants. They were taken care of. All throughout the year, they did things for this family. DeSoto County, there was a middle-aged man who was sitting in his house one day with a bottle of alcohol and a pistol. And a knock came on the door and some people came to invite him to Sunday school from the church. He invited them in. They talked for a while, had a good time. When they left, he put the pistol back in the safe and put the bottle of alcohol under the sink. And months after that, he was baptized into the church there. And the reason he was baptized into the church is because one day by the control of God, some people from the church walked in and said to him, why don't you come to Sunday school? Why don't you come to church? And he put it up and he did. And when I think about that story, I remember crying like a baby that day. Just very emotional because I thought about what would have happened if they hadn't have gone. Third story, a young Delta boy who grew up there, whose parents never attended church, met a Sunday school teacher named Herman Peoples and Willie Betts, and they brought that little boy into church and later brought his parents into the church with their witness, and they all found a love for God and made a difference. When I think about that young Delta boy, I'm talking about myself because that's what happened to me. And here I am now, retired and enjoying life, and I think about what a difference it would have made if it hadn't been for those people. Now, what are we doing to make a difference? If we don't have the relationship, if we're not living righteously, if we're not being real about it, we're not going to be touching people. But do you realize that each one of us have a network of people we touch that we can make a difference in their lives? I don't know how we're going to do that, except as God leads. They had those people to, to visit this middle-aged man, met those little children and a wife who didn't know what to do. Met that young boy in the Delta and his parents and changed their lives. Whose life could we change if we saw the reality of what Titus has to say? Our invitation is going to be different today. I want you to remain seated for it. I'm going to ask Dolores to come to the piano and, and she's going to play for us uh, softly and tenderly. And as she plays, I want us to go to the Lord in prayer. And I want us to ask God for one person that we can become an influencer, a changer, as Titus was asked to do in his book. One person that we will attempt to make a difference in their lives like these churches made in Atala County and DeSoto County and Sunflower County that has changed a person, a family's life. So as she plays softly and tenderly, would you just go to the Lord in prayer and say, Lord, what can I do? Who can I go see? And wait for Him to give us an answer. To the Lord.
I have been blessed by seeing you again and I always am blessed by that. I hope you have a great rest of the week. Don't forget to continue to pray for those we mentioned today and the challenge that they are facing that they will have. Let's have a word of closing prayer. Dismiss us with your grace. Send us into the world with your mercy. May we change lives. May it begin with us. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.